Hi, I'm David Plotz, the CEO of CityCast. And today, as America is white knuckling through one of the tightest presidential elections in modern history, we're bringing you a special episode unlike anything you've heard or read on national media. We're calling it our Swing State Special. You probably know that in addition to your local CityCast, we have shows in 12 other cities around the US. And like your local hosts and producers, those shows have their fingers on the pulse of what's happening locally in their cities. Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and Pennsylvania, Madison in Wisconsin, Las Vegas and Nevada. How are these cities preparing for the presidential election? What are they expecting? What is happening there? And what is about to? Today on CityCast USA, here is what the swing state cities are talking about. Everyone is recording. Yes, good. Yeah. Yes. All professionals here. We've got CityCast in four swing state cities, the blue dots in purple states. If Kamala Harris is going to win the presidential election, she will need huge majorities in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and Pennsylvania, which is probably the most important state in this presidential election. She'll want huge majorities in Las Vegas, in closely contested Nevada, in Madison, in closely contested Wisconsin, she also has to win. So hello, CityCast Pittsburgh host Megan Harris. Hi. And CityCast Philly host Trinae Noree. Hey. And in Wisconsin, CityCast Madison host Bianca Martin. Hello. And in Nevada, CityCast Las Vegas host David Figler. Hey there. So I want to start in Pennsylvania. I think a lot of people, a lot of Americans are concerned and interested in the Pennsylvania electoral count because from what I understand, Megan, you all count really slowly. Why is that? So the main thing is mail-in ballots, um, which I think all of us have been hearing about all over the country. They can't be counted at all until the polls open on Election Day. So they start counting immediately in 67 counties all over our Commonwealth. But as you can imagine, that slows down the process. Trinae, how many mail-in ballots are there going to be in Pennsylvania? About two million. That is a lot. Yeah, wow. it is. But less than 2020, there were three million then. Trinae, when you look at Pennsylvania's counting, what are the ways in which this could go wrong in your state? Right. Similar to what Megan just said about that slow count. I mean, there was a report that Allegheny County on Pittsburgh side is faster than counting ballots in Philly. So I just recently spoke with Commissioner Seth Bluestein, a Republican who is one of the top three election officials here in the city. And he said they've been investing in more equipment and staff to do a faster count. But again, that law, Act 77, does not allow us to start until Election Day. Yeah, I mean, and just to speak to the problems, I mean, gosh, I just got back from touring the warehouse where we actually do that count with those new fancy machines um, purchased largely with COVID money, like the COVID relief money. Our county set some aside for that, but it is a well-oiled machine. And I was asking them about like potential problems. And honestly, David, they said like the main thing that they worry about is someone in the county will oversleep and not get to the precinct to open the doors in time. Someone will have stored their election machines in a closet somewhere somewhere and completely forgotten it and they can't figure out how to find their own election machine in the building where they are or that like a machine will malfunction slightly. Um, but they have tech support people on staff for that. Or if anything goes wrong, like it's really squirrely, they will dispatch a new machine to that precinct almost immediately. I think they said there's almost 300 people on call all day long just to make sure that everything goes right at every single precinct in Allegheny County. It's a pretty solid system. And the concern is that if it does take days to count these votes, that's when it misinformation fills the void. Mm -hmm. So Blue Stein, the election official here, he told me that the window of time from when the polls close to the time when the race is actually called is so important and often a large window of space for misinformation, harassment and threats to occur. David, do you remember what happened in 2020? I mean, I can barely remember what happened yesterday. What happened in 2020? <laughs> well, all eyes were on Philly. That's when two guys were actually arrested. They had assault rifles outside the Pennsylvania Convention Center in Center City days after the election. And these guys were convinced by Trump's rhetoric that the election was stolen. This was all while they were still counting the votes. Megan, when do you expect we'll hear results from Pennsylvania, either early results 
or the final results? I mean, here in Pittsburgh, they're estimating that we will have preliminary results, so not not certified, but preliminary by midnight at the latest. And our secretary of state here in Pennsylvania said, don't expect the whole state to be finished. Um, You know, what we have in Philly and Pittsburgh are different than what many of our outlying counties have. So election night might not be feasible, but we have several days then to certify it. I think by our state laws, we have 15 days to get the final count in. Then there's five days for legal challenges challenges, which, as you can imagine, can slow things down. But they've already scheduled the meeting where they'll certify the votes. That's going to be in November. So they seem pretty certain that everything's going to go okay. I'm crossing my fingers here. I also want to mention former Republican Pennsylvania Governor Tom Corbett, who has been really involved in this whole process. And, you know, he believes Trump is full of it. He says the elections are not stolen and that we may not know here in Philly until Friday who won the state. This is Bianca over in Madison. I'm just really curious because like you guys, our elections are just so closely watched. Do you guys have election watchers? Uh, Is that a discussion in your state in terms of people going to the polls and maybe even congesting the space and causing kind of that sort of confusion? And there's a lot of early voting here. So that's already kind of started here. It's county by county in Pennsylvania, which is super weird and obnoxious. But here in Pittsburgh and Allegheny County, there's a workaround to early voting. So there have been satellite offices open on weekends where folks can go in and same day register to vote, request a mail-in ballot, be handed one, and then do all of the steps in front of a human being who tells you you're doing it right, you're filling it out correctly, you're putting the date where you need to, you're sealing it in the right envelopes, and then you hand it back to that human. So folks have like kind of popped into that. But the county always expects people at precincts, and they also set up space for people in the warehouse. So if you have RSVP'd, within reason, you can stand at a distance, and they have huge screens up mounted where you can see, like, the live footage of various parts of the warehouse. And, you know, you can watch and make sure that you are convinced that it's going well. I mean, it is. It's always going well. Bianca, let's go to your dear state of Wisconsin, to Dane County, which is probably the most important county in the state if you're Kamala Harris, that if she is going to win, she's got to get huge majorities in Milwaukee and a huge majority in Dane County where Madison is located because the rest of Wisconsin is pretty red. And if she's going to win the presidency, she, she, she almost certainly has to win Wisconsin. So what have you guys seen in terms of early voting? in Wisconsin. Is it is it happening? Is it up? Is it down? Who does it look like it's helping? Yeah, yeah. So it's definitely up. Early voting is on fire. And yes, Dane County is a powerhouse for Democrats, and it is definitely the most important county. I will say there are some other blue pockets <laughs> across our state, but yeah, it, it, it is very deeply purple. Uh, and early voting, man, according to the Wisconsin Election Commission, our state has seen a 40% increase in folks voting in-person absentee from our last Last presidential election in 2020. What does that mean in person absentee? That is such a weird <laughs> phrase. It is kind of like makes it obscure for some reason. It, it really is just early in person voting in essence. But they don't just call it early voting because you can also vote early by mail. So what uh, in person absentee voting is, is that you go to one of the designated early in person polling places fill out your ballot, hand it over to the clerk, and they put it in a red bag with a bunch of other people's early ballots. That bag is then transferred to City Hall in what's called a chain of custody to be securely stored at City Hall until Election Day, because like Pennsylvania, all of our votes are counted on Election Day. And then at 7 a.m. on the 5th, those ballots will start to be processed. Yeah, that sounds really similar to us, Bianca, <laughs> just slightly different. Like you have, we have a box and you have a bag. Yeah, and Box we have- feels like a better idea than a bag. <laughs> yeah, a bag is crazy. Like you secure the bag. What do you mean? <laughs> what is the bag made of? Is it not? It's not like a paper bag, is it? It looks almost like a hospital type, like something that you'd have a first aid kit in. It looks like it's probably as weatherproof, you know, REI, hmm. you know, backpack. Like a whatever. hazardous materials <laughs> container of some sort. <laughs> I mean, at this point, yeah, basically. Yeah. All right. <laughs> what, Bianca? Yeah. What are the theories about why in-person absentee, aka early voting, is up in Wisconsin? 
Yeah, I think the biggest theory is just that we have been made very aware how significant our vote is in this presidential election. It has been reiterated to us over and over again in terms of how we're going to have an outweighed impact. And that's how everyone is on this conversation today. Joe Biden beat Trump by only 20,000 votes. And that's something that we repeatedly hear, like how close it will be. And we constantly are having major names come through Wisconsin, you know, the kickoff for early voting in Madison, we had Democratic all-stars Barack Obama, Tim Walls, actor Bradley Whitford, um, Donald Trump and J.D. Vance are constantly in, in Wisconsin making stops. And, you know, it's not just recently, like the whole year we've had presidential visits, vice president come and cabinet members and surrogates visit Wisconsin. But then the other main theory is the money. The money and investment, is it goes down the ticket. Our Senate race is one of the most expensive in the nation. Already over $100 million in outside spending. And, you know, <laughs> I found this interesting. Fraction of that is supporting each candidate. So like, go Eric Covdi, go Senator Baldwin, like under 10%. And then 40 million for each of them are attack ads. And so speaking for myself, in terms of why people might be early voting, they might just want it to be over <laughs> because you can't watch yes. Sunday football can, without the most disturbing can. ads. I know it's not funny, but I mean, we got to laugh not to cry. Wait, actually, can I ask you guys all about this? We'll, we'll get to Nevada in a second, but David, contribute here. What is it like to be a media consumer in your cities? Because I live in a place where there's very little being contested. And so I, the ads I see, you know, I see an occasional Senate ad for Maryland, but very little else. Is it just every single advertisement you see wherever you are is political and it's every nasty. line yes. of sight, every bar, everywhere you go. The sphere, David, the famous sphere has been purchased uh, for an ad by Kamala Harris that lasts for a minute with and, and they only on occasion allow music to come out of it. But on this one, you've got Beyonce's freedom blasting for a minute. It is omnipresent. Yeah. And I mean, across every platform. Yeah, yeah it's on YouTube. I can't watch any of the Halloween um, baking <laughs> shows. And also, like, even in the mail, I don't even get bills anymore. I'm getting flyers to vote. I'm so sick of it. You just want your bills back. Like, I just please. want the bills. Give me the bills. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm looking at my inbox and I mean, we're recording this kind of still in the morning. And I think I've had something like 47 emails, like just from campaign stuff. Oh, yeah. But and the text too. The text, the phone calls, the social feeds. It's nuts. That's so funny. Our mailman, I've had the same mailman for two decades. He has decided that this is when he is retiring. He is retiring at the end of the week <laughs> because he's just tired probably oh, of this delivery. Oh, no. It's a true story. We just signed his gift card. Oh, that's, I, I love our relationship with our mailmen and, and women and yeah. people, our male persons. I want to note, too, like in Wisconsin, it's not just the presidential race. It's not just the Senate race. No. Uh, right. For Wisconsin, it's our legislative races in a way that I've never really seen before, including the dark ads on, on Sunday night football. The legislature has been setting records for their elections and how much money is being spent. And I think that at least for Wisconsin, it's because we have new maps. So we have new legislative maps and we had one of the famously one of the worst gerrymanders in the country. And when those struck down, we have new competitive districts now across the state where people for you know up to 12 years, their vote might not have mattered. So that's both in like Democratic strongholds and also Republican strongholds. So there is a lot of energy there. And with the overturn of Roe v. Wade, right, like people are really, I think, thinking more about the state's power. So we're seeing a lot of energy. And I think that's why early voting has been the way it has been. And that's an example of how you because you have a Supreme Court now in the state Supreme Court in Wisconsin that famously has flipped from a conservative to a uh, liberal majority. And I guess that decision to change the maps is one of the factors that has affected the political campaign enormously. Yes, absolutely. I think that's one of the main rulings from our state Supreme Court that's impacting this election is the gerrymandering decision. Uh, it was fought tooth and nail for months before that. You know, they every kind of obstruction to not changing the advantage that the GOP had in the legislature was tried. And, you know, we did end up with new maps. Uh, I think it also the one of the other major rulings that came forward was the ban on ballot drop boxes. So that we had a ban 
there for since 2022, after Donald Trump lost by 20,000 votes to President Joe Biden, you know, there's so much discussion about voter fraud and, you know, a lot of unsubstantiated claims that there was significant voter fraud. And then that decision came two years later. Now we have a liberal majority and they overturned that by a vote four to three. So I think that also might have an impact in this election. With a liberal majority in your Supreme Court, are you guys still geared up there for election challenges like Sirius go after it if, you know, one candidate or the other doesn't win? I mean, is there talk about it in Madison that that is probably coming? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's pretty. And and across the state, we know that we are not going to know who won on November 5th. I think that's pretty clear in people discussing that. Yeah. A lot of officials here in Pennsylvania have said they kind of expect court challenges. But if there's a decisive victory on either side, that could at least quell some people from filing. But it it just depends. Is the Pennsylvania state Supreme Court partisan and is it does it have a partisan majority in one direction? Yeah, actually, I was thinking as Bianca was talking, um, we actually have something sort of similar. So we have a Democratic majority right now as well. And they just made a a late breaking election ruling as well. So before, if you made a mistake on a mail in ballot, it just got thrown out. And now that's not the case. Uh, You can do a provisional ballot on Election Day and it has to be counted if there are no other issues that would disqualify it from going through. It started as a case here in Western Pennsylvania, but the court just ruled on it. So now it's going to hopefully make it more possible for more ballots to be counted as intended. Let's go out to the West, to Nevada, another very close state, probably of these three states, the least important. Um, oh, thank you. Sorry. Because it just, you just have so few electoral votes. And so it takes some it takes some it takes some metal gymnastics to figure out how Nevada is the tie breaking state. But it's not impossible. Would I think I think Harris would probably have to like win Georgia and Nevada and lose Pennsylvania. We're or something. part of every major like word problem that comes to a solution for one party or the other. They want our mighty, mighty six. <laughs> yes, your mighty six. There you go. Mm-hmm. So you have in Las Vegas uh, where you host City Cast Las Vegas, David Figler, the key population center. So From what I understand, Nevada has increased ballot access or it increased it in the pandemic and it has maintained and made permanent some of the ways they increased ballot access. So what did your state do to increase ballot access and who is it helping? Well, it's uncertain who it's helping. And and that's kind of the thing, uh, David, is that. The old modeling is out the window. Some commentators here are calling this a unicorn year because this is the first presidential election with all these new voting access laws in place. So during the pandemic, obviously, they wanted people to still be able to do it remotely. And so there was a universal mail ballot uh, that was passed and then that was made permanent. So now every registered voter gets a ballot at their address. And they can do a number of things with it. Uh, They could discard it, uh, hopefully in a safe manner. They could fill it out, sign it and mail it in. Or they can do what seems like a variation because Vegas is the buffet capital of the world. All the options that I've already (laughs) heard from the other swing states, you could bring it down and put it in a box. You could bring it down, have them destroy it and then go and vote. You could sign an affirmation, which is what I did when I went to vote, that I will destroy it in a proper way and then went and voted in the booth. So universal mail ballots was probably the biggest change of of the system. We also have automatic voter registration at not just the DMV, but also places like the Department of Health and Human Services. So when you sign up for a license or you sign up for services, as long as you prove uh, identification and you're not disqualified because of lack of citizenship or some other reason, you get automatically registered. And a lot of those registrations default to nonpartisan. And so we have seen a surge of nonpartisan voters like we've never seen before. And, you know, the main impact of these and and other laws, including greater access out on the reservations for Native Americans, we're seeing way, way more votes coming in, especially early on than ever before. What kind of trends are you seeing in those numbers? I assume there's more of this early voting. Yeah, so, so much more. So traditionally, the modeling here is that because Clark County is the most populous of all the population centers in Nevada. That's where Las Vegas is. There are more Democrat 
register voters here. And so in prior elections, there's been a wall. They call it the the blue wall of Clark County. It is a firewall that all the other votes have to kind of chip away at as the votes come in. The rural area, very solidly red. Well, we've seen that completely flip around. There is a red wall. There is a red wall of early voting. The rurals are coming out like never before. And so now the Dems are hoping that as time progresses, that wall gets chipped away with the mail-in ballots, with people who are waiting for Election Day. So there is a lot of nail-biting going on. Um, And no one knows what these nonpartisans or other party people are doing. (laughs) You know, I mean, there's polling, obviously, et cetera, but it doesn't have that same sort of like percentages that prior modeling for predictions have been based on. And, you know, this would be the first time since George Bush was elected in 2004 that there's a stronger possibility that our purplish state is going to go for the Republican for president. Vegas, as you said, in Clark County is historically the, the it's the Democratic stronghold. Right. But it sounds like less so a little bit. Why might that be? Well, just registration battles, the Republicans were doing better than they had done before. And then there's these other factors that are out there. But what's really interesting to me, David, is that like all this early voting that's happening that really did seem to be favoring the Republicans caused light bulbs to go off nationally. And we have a very important Senate race here as well between incumbent Jackie Rosen and her challenger, uh, a fellow named Sam Brown, who's fairly recent to our state. And the RNC had all but pulled every single ad and all the funding for Sam Brown because he was just polling so poorly. At one point, Jackie Rosen, not terribly long ago, was up in some polls by as much as double digits. As the early voting came in, Mitch McConnell and, and his pack decided, wait, Nevada's still in play for Senate and pivoted, poured tons of money in. And now it seems as though that margin of distance between the Senate candidates falls within the margin of error. And and so it's really interesting that all of a sudden a very what all people had written off as a non-competitive race is once again competitive for a very important part of that majority of who will be in the Senate. You know, this is Bianca and Madison. The exact same thing happened in Wisconsin. Mitch McConnell's pack did just make a major donation for Eric Covde just recently. And, and our race is increasingly getting, it's really close. So that it really made a big difference to see like millions of dollars come in like that last minute. I'm just curious how each of you feels about living in a swing state during this most contentious of presidential elections. There's going to be a presidential election result. You know, depending on your interest, you may be happy, you may be sad about it. You don't know yet. Um, But will you be relieved to no longer be the center of attention or are you going to miss it? I don't think we'll be leaving the center of attention. This is Bianca and Madison. (laughs) I'm just kidding. (laughs) Wisconsin politics stays pretty close to it has a big impact forever. But no, I, I actually I feel super happy for my vote to actually matter, having lived in D.C. and just how strange that system is to feel, you know, kind of trapped by by a number of things. But yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, similarly in Pennsylvania, like if anything, it just makes me sad that my friends and the rest of the country feel like their vote doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, you know, like we have I have a presidential candidate that like is coming to the coffee shop across from where I live. And I can meet him if I want to. It's almost like back in the day with the caucuses in Iowa where you're watching these people like chat with folks over burgers. And like, it's a strange thing to suddenly be thrust into. I don't know if that's kind of your feeling, Trine. Yeah, Trine here in Philly. Uh, I mean, I often would ask a question of how do we make voting sexy? And I just feel (laughs) like all of this drama is not the way. But what I'm most concerned about in these coming days and even the days after the election is just how is everyone going to respond to the results? Are people going to freak out? Are there going to be protests? Are there going to be threats to our elected officials? Like, I want people to participate in this system because this is our right, our privilege, but not to the extent where, you know, you're threatening American democracy. 
Despite your uh, poo-pooing of our mighty six electoral votes, David Plotz, we do still seem to be a center of attention no matter what, just because we're Las Vegas and people want to come here. We had Brian Cranston knocking door to door trying to get people to get out the vote. So, you know, will I miss it? No. Uh, but also, you know, I do like getting calls from friends I haven't heard from from non-swing states asking how things are, how are things going, because they think Nevada is <laughs> important, too. And so it's always a good reason to catch up with folks. But, you know, we're always going to be in the mix, sir. Thanks for joining us on CityCast USA, the Swing State Edition. If you have friends or family living in another CityCast hub, please tell them about the great podcast in their hometown. You can tell them to vote, too, if Election Day hasn't passed. We'll be back tomorrow with a regular episode of your local CityCast. Till then, goodbye. Goodbye, y'all. Bye. Bye. Bye.